Hey, everybody. Welcome to this month's episode or issue or whatever we want to call it of Don't Get Rusty. Uh, today, we are doing Diversify Your Pilot Portfolio, Compound Your Currency with a Commercial Certificate. So um, we are excited to get going. But before we do that, let's make sure we just go through some of the basic housekeeping. The big part is we want to make sure all you can interact. So let's just briefly go over those directions. Um, as you can see on the screen, I'm going to look at the one at the top first, Attendee Control Panel. If you are using a computer, your menu is going to look something like this. And if you want to interact and ask a question, just make sure you look for the little bubble uh, icon with the question mark in it. Type your question down here and then make sure you click the send button because if you don't do that, we won't see it. Uh, and then over here, if you're using an iPad or some kind of tablet or something like that, uh, then what you're going to look for is in the app, you'll see this little question mark up here. And again, you'll click on that question mark, type in your question and make sure you hit the send button. And that way we'll make sure that we see your question. All right. My name is Chris Moser. I am the senior director here uh, at AOPA of Flight Training Education. And as you can see, I'm a teacher, uh, musician, some other stuff, flight instructor, all that good stuff. And I work basically with schools and uh, flight schools and CFIs to support them. With us today, our special guest is Drew. Drew, introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Name is Drew Myers. I manage the Flying Clothes Initiative here with the You Can Fly Initiative, uh, instrument rated commercial pilot, which we'll be talking about. Um, got my private license back in 2015 and just recently got my commercial. So it's just been a nice, easy, leisurely stroll through my aviation career in Radiance. Um, I'm also an AGI. I'm a fast team rep with the Baltimore Fizzo, new dad and a bird enthusiast and bowling enthusiast. And also <laughs> I'm a proud member of the Free State Flying Club. I've been a member since 2018. I, I joined after I got my license and that really you know, changed kind of my perspective on flying and I think made me a much better pilot. And that's a big part of why I'm here today talking to you and, and I'm part of the Flying Clubs Initiative. So we help start and support uh, flying clubs all over the country. We've um, started over 220 clubs to date. We support a network of 900 active flying clubs um, all, all across the US. So if you have, are you interested in joining or forming a flying club, please reach out to me. I'd love to, to get you started down the path. There's a lot of opportunities out there and um, you know, there's there's probably clubs in your area that you don't even know about. So I'd be happy to help you there. And I'll, one last plug, our Club Connection newsletter publishes this Sunday, third Sunday of every month. Everything uh, club, Flying Clubs related is in there. So check it out. All right. So there's the full plug for the Flying Clubs. Thanks, Drew, for being here. And part of this, the idea for this webinar was his anyway. He wanted to talk about just some good reasons of why you might want to get your commercial. So we're going to talk about that. And also... Of course, with us today, as always, and we'll get to Dan in just a moment. But behind the scenes, Stephen, say hello, Stephen. Hello, Stephen. <laughs> there he is. And of yeah. course, Stephen, introduce yourself again real quick. Just a quick one. So I am the coordinator with the Flight Training Initiative. I work here with these fine gentlemen. And I get to kind of dip my hands in all kinds of things that we do around AOPA. Uh, primarily, I work with our Flight Training Experience Survey, keep Chris on track as best I can, and get to uh, manage from behind the scenes on this lovely program. All right. Cool. And so if you have questions or things like that, those will be going to Stephen and our other guest today. And uh, Dan, introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Uh, Dan Justman, lucky enough to work with these fine fellas in the You Can Fly programs with the AOPA Foundation. I've been flying for 20 and change years um, and just love general aviation. And I'm thrilled to be able to work with uh, the AOPA Foundation and the You Can Fly group um, on helping other people uh, grow and support their aviation dreams. So I'd love to be a part of it. Happy to be here. Instrument rated private pilot. Uh, I will be working behind the scenes to help with questions. And actually, since we're there, I've got two of them that I thought were really good. We'll do those real quick and then we'll move on. Uh, so real quick, is there an upper age limit to earning a commercial certificate? I don't, I've never seen no. one of those. I don't think there's anything like that. It's basically no. just, it's 18. So yeah. And right. really, I mean, the airlines typically have their upper age limit for mandatory requirement on that, but that's just for the airlines. That's not, uh, you know, for charter or or other types of flying. Um, and the other yeah. quick question is, what is an AGI? Go ahead, oh, Drew. AGI, thanks. Yeah, that is a advanced ground instructor. So it's part, you know, uh, part of being an instructor is you you do you give ground instruction. So I can log ground instruction with with a pilot or student pilot, and I can also endorse um, applicants to take written exams. Very cool. 
All right. So we're good to go. That's the team with us here today. And I just did verify 61-123. The only age thing that's listed is 18 years of age to get your commercial. So, uh, so I've never seen an upper age limit. And maybe what folks are thinking about is the um, like an airline pilot have to have that mandatory. Yeah. So as long as you can get a medical, which we're going to talk about, you, you can get your commercial. Yep. Exactly. All right, cool. Let's keep going here. All right. So big thing, we want to make sure we thank uh, our sponsors, Jeppesen, Flight, and Boeing uh, for sponsoring the program. Always appreciate you guys and uh, make sure you check out their good products. Um, quick reminders, and Drew, he's going to help me with this one too. First thing, Drew, do they get Wings credit for this? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Yes. So yes, you'll get Wings credit if you are viewing live, only if you're viewing live. And the other question we always get is, what do I have to do to get Wings credit? You don't have to do anything as long as you registered for the program using the email that's the same for your um, uh, FAAsafety.gov account, you're good to go. Uh, if for some reason you don't think you did, then you can message Steven uh, just in the chat there or whatever, and um, he'll help you out. But like I said, if you've already registered using that same email, you have nothing to do. We're going to take care of it. Steven's going to get it submitted for you. Um, mm -hmm. So no big deal at all. And the other one, maybe Drew can answer this one. Drew, is this being recorded? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. So yes, it is being recorded and it will show up on AOPA's YouTube channel, uh, the AOPA pilot video it's now called. That'll show up there probably in a couple of days because it takes a few days to get processed and uploaded. So you'll see it there on what is today, Thursday. So probably definitely by Monday or maybe over the weekend, but probably Monday. So anyway, check it out there and you can also find it on AOPA.org webinars once it is uploaded. So you just got to give us a little bit of time because it does take time for the computer to process everything and then get it through uh, our system here because we don't actually get to upload them. For some reason, they don't let us control AOPA is web stuff i don't know why <laughs> not that we would do anything all right so check this out this is our our trivia for this month march 16th um, 1907 in france it is the first biplane what do you think drew look at the uh, uh the the performance here we talk about commercial performance yeah height of 13 feet 260 feet distance what do you like you like it yeah i could uh, that's a power off 180 right there <laughs> <laughs> that's as good, good as a balloon um yeah. so so there you go. So kind of cool. Um, and let's get started, of course, as we always do with our poll. And we just wanted to get an idea. This was on one of Drew's ideas. Let's get an idea of what we have or the folks, the experience level we've got out in the audience. So how many hours do you have? Less than 40, 40 to 99, 100 to 249, 250 or more, or I've got so many I don't even count anymore, or maybe I just can't remember or forgot. What do you think, Drew? What's your answer on this one? Um who for me or like what the what the audience is going to say yeah what do you think the audience is going to say um i think we're going to be answer c 100 to 249 is my my guess okay very cool could be that um i'm gonna say i'm gonna bet i'm gonna guess there maybe there's a contingent more than 250 so i'm gonna go with d being the top one so if you would you got the the poll popped up um in your uh, i think it's in the chat section we can see it there it's actually under the poll section it should have popped up on a window so please fill that out and let's see what happens. Now I actually can see the stuff coming in. We got about 80% voted. Actually, that's great. Look at that. That's guys less than a minute. Awesome. Let's go ahead and close the poll, Stephen, and take a look at the results. And Ooh. sharing those results. So there it is. I took 250 or more. So actually, it's kind of curious. I wish we had a follow-up poll that would ask, you know, for folks whether they had a private or commercial already or whatever. So just to see who's in the audience. Yeah. So, all right. Very cool. Well, looks like I would have won that bet, and so you owe me a Coke, I think, Drew. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Coke Zero or regular, let me know. <laughs> exactly. I prefer root beer. All right, anyway, so what are we doing today? Today we're going to talk about why get your commercial. And again, Drew and I had a really, we're going to have a good conversation about this, I know. So some of the reasons why you might want to get it, could it be things like increased proficiency, advanced knowledge? Um, and then we're definitely going to talk about the eligibility to get your commercial if you want to do that, the limitations that come with it as well, and the check ride tips. But the big thing um, that I want to say right now, and we'll try to remember to uh, tell everybody as well, is there is a handout. Um, available and it says DGR commercial certificate handout. We've got tons of links. Drew found some great stuff. We'll reference those as we go through, but we've provided lots of stuff for you guys to use. So let's kick this off, Drew. What do you think? Why get your commercial certificate? What do you think? What are your What are the reasons that you went for it? Oh man, can you can you hear me okay? Yeah, cool. Um, 
for me, I, honestly, I, I was having a, a newborn son on the way, and it, it seemed like a, a good way to just add another margin of safety to my flying. I plan on doing some fa family flying in the future. Um, and also just uh, I wanted the challenge, and I, I wanted to be able to you know, maybe branch out and do some compensated flying down the road. Very cool. So the idea of potential future things and everything else. But the big part is, the, does getting a commercial mean that you have to go to the airlines? No, absolutely not. Um, there's plenty of plenty of commercial pilots out there that I I don't think have ever been paid for flying. I know I haven't. Um, I don't even I don't even have a, a second class medical right now, so I legally can't be compensated for flying. And we're we're going to be talking about that too. Yep, we'll get into all those types of things as well. But of course, one of the big things that I know we discussed a lot about is actually can you don't have to do it for the airlines. It doesn't have to be for that reason, but it is one of the big benefits that comes out of it is that you take your VFR flying and crank it up to a new level. And you just recently did your commercial. It was just last year. Yep. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, so I coming out of the instrument a, a few years ago, um, I got my instrument rating. I'm, I'm kind of doing this thing where instead of getting a flight review, I just get another rating just to avoid doing the flight review. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> the flight reviews are easier, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. No, and, and by the way, as a fast team rep, flight reviews, you should do them way more than every two years. So I encourage you all to do that. Um, I, I agree. That. I agree. Yeah. it's. It, I mean, the airlines train way more often than, than private pilots do. So why, why shouldn't we just you know, train a lot more? Um, so, so yeah, the, it was cool going from the instrument training. And of course, after I got my rating, I did a ton of instrument flying, being able to, to get back out of the flight deck and, you know, look around and do all these visual maneuvers and, you know, really kind of explore the, the envelope of the airplane a little bit more, you know, with, in a, in a, in instrument flying, you're, it's all stabilized approaches, standard rate climbs, standard rate turns, you know, but um, with the commercial, you really get to kind of ring out the airplane a little bit more and, and, and see what it can do. So that was a lot of fun. And then obviously the, the navigation and the, you know, the, the rules that you have to learn and understand um, were a big part of, you know, making it, Kind of like a more heavy duty VFR type of course. Yeah, and we'll get, we're going to go into detail and into each of those topics and talk a little bit more about them. And of course, the one thing we're making kind of an assumption here, um, it's that with getting your commercial, it's likely that you probably already have your instrument rating if you're going for your commercial. Most people will do that. That's the typical path. You can, however, get your commercial certificate without doing an instrument rating, assuming you meet all the hours. There will be some limitations on that, mm -hmm. um, and you'd see that in the regs. It's it's actually in the in the six. I like to call it the 61120s. I will reference that later um, in the regs. Uh, what I mean by 61120s is generally the commercial stuff is going to be in your 61, 121, 123, 125, etc. So I call it the 120s in general. So um, go check that out. Um, and in fact, it, even, it bumps a little bit up into the 130s. I just happen to be looking at my far aim here. All right. <laughs> another benefit, too, is insurance, right? So, Drew, you mentioned, too, that getting your commercial, you saw a discount. Can you just tell us briefly about that? Yeah. Uh, I, went to, I went to renew my non-owned insurance. Um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I'm over 500 hours of total time. And, you know, I got, got this new rating and everything. I saved, like, $7 on my non-owned insurance policy. So. Hey. That's a gallon of gas, man. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, almost a gallon of gas. Um, but beside that, though, I mean, especially when you're talking about you know my flying club, having um, uh, pilots with higher ratings in the club will lower the insurance premium for everyone. So if you're in a flying club or considering joining one, you know, being a more qualified, more experienced pilot can only can only help you. It's not going to hurt. So that, there's there's that um, that side of it, I think. And, you know, I, obviously I'm, I'm going to shop around for my non-owned and see if I can get a better rate somewhere next year. But yeah. And, and one thing I will say, too, is that I do um, I, I know some folks. In fact, my wife worked in the insurance industry, uh, the aviation insurance industry for uh, several years. And I did run this by her, too. And she said, yes, it does. Typically, is going to give you a discount on that. You, typically going to get it cheaper, but of course, shop around with the different companies to, to see what discounts you may get. But getting those higher ratings is normally going to result in you getting lower rates. Um, all right. Maybe it's only $8. Maybe it's more. Who knows? Uh, the other part is, of course, getting your commercial. You can get job opportunities. You don't have to. It doesn't mean like if the only thing you're, it's like, if you're thinking like, I really don't want to necessarily do any jobs with it, but just getting your commercial, it could be enough just to do the advanced stuff. And that's kind of the discussion that we're going to have today. Um, but yes, it does open you up to potentially making money as a pilot yeah. as well. So yep. go ahead. Now, yeah. Drew, you did say 
there was one big downside. Can you please tell us what this big downside is? Because that's kind of an unusual thing to say when we're pr promoting people potentially yeah. in a commercial. Yeah, guys, I, I didn't realize this when I got the rating, and I'm, I'm rethinking everything now. Um, the problem is when you get your commercial and you don't work as a pilot, you spend the rest of your days explaining to people, well, yeah, I'm a commercial pilot, but I don't fly for a living. So just be prepared for that. If you if you do go the route like I am, and I'm not trying to be a career pilot, but you you have your commercial rating. So just have something something in the bag ready to go when when someone asks, well, you're a commercial pilot, but you don't work for the airlines. What's that all about? Just just be prepared to explain that. Yeah, probably a good idea to have a good joke for that because I've had that happen to me as well. It's like, oh, you're a pilot. Do you fly for blank? You know, Delta, whomever. And uh, it's like, no, I don't. Um, but it's anyway. kind of. It's kind of like working with working at AOPA. Like we work in aviation, but we don't fly for a living, right? So it's kind of that that's that same thing. Exactly. All right. So let's get into the details here about uh, some of these benefits we were talking about. Now, the first one we talked about was this idea of advanced VFR. And you and I, I know, Drew, we were planning this thing out. We talked about some of our favorite things that we got from our commercial. But like you already said, you push the envelope on the airplane. You get to know your airplane better. And that's by doing um, new maneuvers um, and all that good stuff. So that said, I'm seeing something weird on the screen. I'm not sure what's going on. Yeah, now. we were, we weren't. Uh, the poll was showing. Um, so I, I changed presenter here. Just uh, bear with me. Okay, let's go ahead and I'll fix that again. I'll make myself presenter and yeah. show my screen. All right, are we back to back hopefully? To perfect. Yeah. All right, awesome. Yeah, the software cool. seemed to have a bit of a hiccup today. It wasn't wasn't taking it off of there. Okay. Glad we got it fixed. Okay, so so mastering the aircraft and yes, pushing those maneuvers, like we said, some new maneuvers. And in fact, um, one of the ones that I know that you really liked, and I put that as that first diagram there. Tell us about this maneuver that's on that that top one. What is this one called? Oh, that's the Chandel, my favorite, 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 favorite. Love that thing. So, I mean, if if I may, just humor me for a second, Chris. Right. <laughs> so it's a it's a maximum performance climbing turn. It's the canyon turn. You're flying into a canyon. You gotta get back out. So you start at maneuvering speed. Nice, uh, nice uh, 30 degree bank into it coming out. Then you slowly level out your bank and you come out at the 180 mark right on the edge of the stall. And you know when it's when it's done perfectly, it's just mwah, chef's kiss. It's such a <laughs> such a satisfying maneuver when you when you do it right and do it well. Um, and and this one really that this was like doing this maneuver was really when I started to to learn what the airplane was telling me. Right, I, I started to understand the cues of like I'm just on the edge of a stall before before even the stall warning would go off. So I, I you understand how much energy you have and how how you can use that to your advantage. So. Yeah, huge fan of the Chandel. <laughs> and a lot of these maneuvers too, especially like the Chandel, when you're performing it, of course, as the airplane, you've got full power on and the airplane's first starting at speed, then slowing down. So it's constantly adding more right rudder um, and the whole time. So it is it is a very good maneuver. And I agree with you. When you nail it, I love it. When you come out of the end of the Chandel, you roll wings level and it's like you're right there. And, you, and just as you hear that stall warning, you just start to beat, you're like, that was awesome. So there's yeah. a, quite a skill yep. of accomplishment. I picked out one. Of, I had two kind of favorites, but I picked out probably my favorite one. And I think one of the hardest ones to do is in that lower right hand corner. And that's the lazy eight. Yeah. For whatever reason, I just enjoyed that. And again, probably because it is so hard to nail. Um, and it's one where you're, you're kind of doing these constant descending and then um, you know, sorry, ascending and descending turns. Uh, and you're kind of drawing an eight with the longitudinal axis of the airplane. So I really like that one. I thought that was a fun yeah. one, and and you master because it. So couple couple quick questions to interject here. We're talking about maneuvers. I had a question about aircraft. Uh, can you use a 172 or 82 training for commercial? Seems like a larger plane would be expensive to rent. So what options are yes. available for commercial training? Yes. We are going to get into that in just okay. a little bit. Thanks. We get to eligibility. So don't worry. We're going to talk about the aircraft you can use. Uh, and so just hang on for us on that one. So are you going to talk about uh, basic med and yep. application for yep. commercial? We're okay, that's do one that, one that we've too. seen blowing up the questions. Great. We'll hold yeah. on that. Thank you. Yep. No, no way. There's more, more, Dan. Well. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the big thing is also not only the maneuvers that can they can help you, and another one I really enjoyed was eights on pylons, um, was yeah. one that I liked, but pump up your VFR skills. So Drew, tell us a little bit about what you were thinking when it came to pumping up these VFR skills. What are some of the things that you got out of it doing your commercial? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, 
honestly, right, how, how many pilots actually fill out paper flight plans anymore or, you know, do that flight planning process after they get their license? You know, it's all on four flight, all that stuff. Well, you know, planning for the cross country for my check ride, I really had to, I had to have a paper log. It was a, a requirement for my DPE. So I had to fill all that out and, you know, going back and, and really pouring over these, these paper charts and maps and stuff. And it really got me thinking about, you know, well, if I, I know he's gonna, if I have like a GPS failure, what's a good waypoint? I, the, the plane that I took my check card in had no VOR receiver aside from um, the, the GPS, right? So I couldn't navigate to a, a fix or a, a VOR station. So I had to do all visual flight planning, just pilotage and dead reckoning, like, like back in, back when you, you know, did your, your cross country. So it was really fun to revisit that and, and like kind of evaluate what's a good checkpoint and what's not a good checkpoint. Um, so that was really fun. Uh, obviously, you have to do some, uh, you're required to do some long cross countries to, to get the rating. We're going to talk about those requirements in a little bit. But just mm -hmm. doing those doing those those flights, you just become such a, a stronger pilot, a better pilot. You you learn your limitations and you also learn how to use the resources at your disposal to, to make smarter decisions. Um, and one and of then, the things, too, I just wanted to throw in there as well with that long cross country. I don't know about you, Drew, as well, but your your confidence is going to go way up. I know when I did mine, yes. I did it from Phoenix, yeah. and I I just moved to Arizona at that point and went from Phoenix all the way to San Diego, and I was nervous about it, but I know doing it, and when I got back, I was like, I felt like this sense of like, wow, this training that I've gotten before has now been cranked up, and, and it made me just feel like I can do this. Yeah, definitely, right. definitely. And then one one more point to that is, um, you know, when you when you get your commercial, you have to have the mindset of I'm a professional pilot. Someone's paying me to fly them places. So having that, there's there there's going to be more external pressures, but also more pressure on you to be a, a safe and competent pilot because people are depending on you now more than more so than before. So that that was a, a kind of a fun angle, a fun lens to look at my at my flying with. Hey Drew, along those lines, we had a question about being held to that higher standard, but it was with the ideas of a flight review. Um, do you feel like once you're, uh, once you earn your commercial certificate, are you held to a higher standard in future flight reviews or other opportunities like that? Well, you know, the, the flight review is not, you know, you're, they're not going to shred your certificate if you don't fly well. Right. So, I mean, I, I would think you should hold yourself to a higher standard. Sure. Um, and we should, we should definitely strive to perform at ACS or better, um, in, in, you know, in our, in our flying and then also in our subsequent training. Um, but no, the, to me, the flight review would be no different no matter what rating I had, as long as, you know, it's just a matter of reviewing the, the things that we probably don't look at that much, like, like emergency procedures or, you know, um, th those, some of the maneuvers that we don't do at, on every standard flight. Chris, do you have any, would you give me a different yeah. flight review knowing I'm a commercial pilot? Not not necessarily. It's like I might say, really what it comes down to when doing a flight review, it's going to be based on the conversation you have with your CFI. What is it you're doing? What kind of flying are you doing? What is it you're working on? And so it's like, have if you have your commercial, I might say, it depends, right? If you're flying all the time and you have your commercial, let's say, yeah, let's go out and let's see if, you know, let's go review some lazy aids and, and just for fun, right, to kind of build that yeah. proficiency. If you are not doing anything like that, you had done your commercial, but you haven't been flying as much recently, then I'm not going to necessarily going to be pushing you on that. I'm going to be looking for let's let's look at those emergency procedures. How are your landings? You know, what kind of flying are you actually doing with it? So so I don't. It's not like there's a legal requirement that you have to to meet your check ride standards because you know that's not the way it works. Flight yep. reviews are really training with your CFI so you're both satisfied that you're you're competent and safe to be pilot in command. So yeah, don't, I wouldn't worry about that sort of thing um, as a limitation. We did have a question I saw that uh, Scott uh, mentioned. He said, what is ADM? Um, I have a feeling though, I think I know Scott though. I think he knows what it is. It's aeronautical decision-making for the folks out there. So we didn't write the whole thing out. And so that's just that part we learn about of making um, that process of making decisions while we are flying. And I will tell you the stuff in commercial that you learn in training is a step above the part for private. And I will tell you too, that as a, I flew professionally um, as a freight pilot and it comes into real play. I had situations that happened and I had situations that I saw with, especially it luckily was not my company, but other companies where they were pushed to fly things sometimes. Uh, and even had been told like, if you don't do it, we're going to fire you. So there, there, it's a real thing in the industry um, to, to get that and to, to know where your limits and boundaries are going to be to be safe. Um, all right, anyway, 
we'll just go quick. I want to move on to the next slide here just to keep us on pace. But so we got uh, obviously getting back to visual. I know I think Drew and I, I think we both had the same experience. Like you do your instrument and your landings just become horrible <laughs> during your instrument for whatever reason. I don't know if you had that experience, but it's great to get back to the commercial because you and I also both agreed that our, one of our favorite things to do is the power off 180. You want to describe that really quickly where the power off 180 works? Yeah. Yeah. So it, Basically, it's a you are a beam, your aiming point on the runway on downwinds, cut your power, and then you try to land on or just after that point. And um, it's challenging, right? The, the 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 conditions are always different. The, the winds, the temperatures, everything everything is a factor at play. So you'll spend a lot of time in the pattern doing these short approaches. And depending on the type of airplane you're in, it can be exciting or it can be kind of a non-event. I, I took my commercial in an RV-12 light sport. So a power off 180 was kind of like a normal landing. They glide really well. Um, then I got checked out in an arrow and did power off 180s and that thing. And oh my goodness, you know, that thing just falls out of the sky. So um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a good practice for any airplane that you're, that you're trying to fly. Um, you know, obviously emergency landings are, are a great thing to practice, but that really teaches you about energy management and, and managing, you know, the, the, the environment around you with winds. Yeah, and it's also my favorite thing. Is, like I said, this is one of my favorite things to do. <clears throat> Nailing the spot when you can not only, it's not even just a, I'm going to make it to the runway like we might do for the private, like emerge, you just got to get on the runway. It's literally like, I'm going to make it to the runway and put it between the aiming points. And when you do yep. it, it's just like, oh, and you get consistent at it. So yeah, way, I love that maneuver. Okay, let's keep moving here. Yeah, um, And I know we got questions out there. Um, yeah, no freight pilots, only freight dogs. I see that, Ken. I know, in fact, I had a great T-shirt for my company that had freight dogs on it and had all of our airplanes. It was cool. All nice. right, so let's, the other part is crank up your knowledge. And so we get into a much deeper understanding of several topics here. So, Drew, take us, what, what did you pick up when you were doing your commercial when it came to regs? Yeah, and, and talking with some experienced CFIs and stuff, you, you really have to have a much deeper understanding of, of the rules and regulations. Um, not just because, of course, you're you're – operating and you may be operating under some different rules but also you know if you have a passenger that's going to be argumentative about something like well why do i have to have my seatbelt on you have to know where in the regs they, they you, to point them to right so having that knowledge and and you know Knowing, being familiar with where things are in the regs is very important. Um, and, you know, uh, minimum equipment's a big one. And then, of course, the the requirements for passengers, like I said, um, oxygen, um, you know, uh, intoxicants, um, you know, the the seat belts and shore harnesses when they're when they're in their seats. You know, that that's all important stuff that you have to have a good a good knowledge of. Um, and, and I mean, yeah. And then moving on to systems, right? So. You know, it used to be you had to do, and we're, like someone asked, you you had to do your your commercial in a complex airplane. It's not the case anymore, but you do have to cover those topics of like what's a constant speed prop, how does it work? Um, talk to me about turbocharging, supercharging. Um, what's a what are some common ways that um, you know some common methods that retractable gear airplanes get their gear up and down, right? And I, I want to mention too. If you if you're in a flying club, right, you're flying the same airplane all the time, or if you own an airplane. If you if you know that's like your forever airplane, like you're going to be flying a Bonanza for the rest of your life, get your commercial in that Bonanza because you're going to have to have that in-depth system knowledge. You're going to have to know everything about that airplane and satisfy your DPE that you have a good understanding of its systems. And then going out and doing all the flight maneuvers, you're going to know that the entire flight envelope of that airplane so well. And it's just going to make you a much more confident pilot in that airplane. Like I... I'm a, I, I feel like I really, really get the RV-12 now after I got my commercial on it. I mean, Chris, I'm and, sure you feel the same way. Oh, absolutely. Of course, I did mine in a 172 RG because back in, back in my day, um, <laughs> we, had to, we weren't allowed to do it. In a, and we'll talk about the technically advanced aircraft in a minute. Um, but yeah, back in my day, we had to do it in, the, in a complex aircraft. So I had to do it in the RG. And so that was out in Arizona and it was kind of a dog, um, but it was still kind of fun to fly. It was cool, you know, having to, to learn about the gear and, and uh, give that just building those that that memory skill of putting them up and down and making sure they're down. Um, and of course, the other part is high altitude. Uh, you you learn about oxygen systems and de-ice equipment, um, so you get to learn a lot more. And it's that's just and this is not even it. This is, these are little samples of the kind of stuff that you learn. But the key part we're trying to get at is you nerd out. You get to go deep. And I know for me, I, I, growing up, I was not a kid. My dad used to rebuild cars. I was never one that really cared about that kind of stuff. Um, but it was when I started flying airplanes, that's when I started learning engines and then getting into the commercial. I, like it was the more I learned about systems, the more I enjoyed it. And it definitely makes you understand your airplane better. Yeah. 
talk about mastering an airplane. This is a great step towards doing that. Absolutely. All right. So let's get into because I know that we've got lots of questions popping up with the different requirements. So I think that's what people want to know. I'm hoping we've made the case here that it's it's a cool thing to get your commercial and we think it's it's going to be useful for you. So let's talk about some of these eligibility requirements. Let's say that you're interested in doing this, that we've made the case. Oh, and by the way, based on that on the discussion you were mentioning in the last slide, Drew, um, I know you mentioned the Bonanza. But you also mentioned the RV-12, super affordable airplane to fly. Yes. We're going to talk about the types of airplanes. You do not have to do this in an expensive airplane. It just needs to meet one of these two requirements. So it is definitely something that can be affordable. Or like you said, if you happen to have something like a Bonanza, you could do the training in that as well if you wanted to. So first thing, commercial pilot knowledge test. And I saw a question um, popping up there. I think actually somebody was asking about the oral, which we'll talk about later, but with the commercial pilot, what did you, how did you see, or what was your experience with the commercial pilot written test, the knowledge test? Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it felt like I was taking my private in some ways. Like there's a lot of very similar questions. You, there's some nav questions and things like that. Um, so the, the review, again, it was a nice refreshing review of a lot of those principles. Again, with a, a, a a deeper a broader depth of knowledge you had to you had to go their surface level and then you had to go below that some to, to to master it and i almost felt like i don't remember taking mine as well that i would say the same thing it felt like the private and i would say it was like at least half of it was almost like private pilot questions and then you had the other half let's say and i'm again i'm just basing this on my memory from a while ago yeah but you know it's like then there are some questions that are digging you deeper new topics potentially uh and then when it gets to the, like the uh the the cross country stuff it's going to ask you to be a little tighter a little more understanding go ahead dan yeah do you guys have any recommendations on how to prepare for that written exam anything that different coming than up later too <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry I'm, you guys are killing me sorry. no that's, that's great no, wait, no, we are going to talk more. about it. and um just back to the back to the written too um in some ways the written for the commercial is similar to what it would be for the, the advanced ground instructor so you, if you have aspirations of being an instructor um it is possible to take those exams on the same day um, yes if, yeah but they, they're they're different they, they're not exactly identical but you need to study for both of them but your your head's already in that game right so you know it, why not bust it down both on the same day that's what i did and that's part of why it's, i'm an agi it's so close that's what exactly what i yeah. did when i did my i guess I, I actually did it with my cfi so i took my cfi written and the uh, the AGI written test with it at the same time. Nice. But yes, take them take them in a similar fashion because it's like you're you're exactly right. They are so close. If you want to do that, go ahead and knock them both out at once, um, because it's like you're studying almost the same material. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about. So that's the written test uh, you got to take. It's the typical thing. We will talk about how to prep for that a little bit later because we've got sure a check ride prep things to get ready. Um, and we'll talk about our recommendations. That's the last slide that we're going to do. But let the medical, I know we had lots of questions about the medical. Yeah. Of course, folks are thinking, what What are they thinking, Drew? Which medical do they think they need? Probably second or first class, right? They have to have yeah. that to, to get your commercial. And, and the reality is to take the to take the check ride, you can have basic med or your third class. Either one is perfectly fine. Um, again, the, the only thing is, and be, you're, you know this is going to come up on the check ride, you can't um, – operate the, under the privileges of your commercial without that second class. So just 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 understand that. And you know, if, if you're like me and don't have, you know, don't plan on flying for pay, then then you're fine, right? But just just understand that if you do ever have the opportunity to to earn a living or earn some money flying, you're gonna have to go out and talk to your AME and get the second class. So I know one of the things I know the recommendations that we always give for folks is it's like if you're like Drew, like you're just, you're just I want to do my commercial, I'm just trying to bump up my pilot knowledge. Absolutely. Use the medical you've got, whether that's basic med or third class. By the way, there is an article or a link in the handout that talks about it's an AOPA article, I believe, from uh, Pilot Protection Services. Uh, I'm not sure if you have to be a PPS member to see that or not. Um, but anyway. It, it, it just lays out the case for why you are allowed to take the check ride using basic med. Yep. So if that's what you're doing, you're good to go. If you actually are planning on going that commercial route, you want to be an airline pilot, uh, advice given to me a long time ago, and I agree with because I used to work at a school where we basically trained folks that were on that path, maybe go get that first class or that second class exam to make sure you can pass it. Um, and of course, as we always say, if you're not sure, if you think there's some medical issue, talk to AOPA first. Um, but go maybe go get that exam because that way you'll know you you meet the requirements so that you can proceed forward with that professional path. And if not, then you'll know okay, well before I spend all this um, these resources and time and everything else, um, I maybe I maybe that's not something I want to do. So just keep that in mind. But 
to just get your commercial, you do not need to have it. So just like Drew said, basic med works. Um, one caveat being that I was in the article that I shared with you guys too, um, that if you are, if you've gotten your private, like the, for your first medical, you can't do basic med as your first medical. You have Correct. to have gotten at least a third class. So for a lot of folks, that third class, especially if you're under 40, is going to last for five years. So you may be riding on that third class for a while. Uh, right. And so if that's the case, you know, then basic med's <laughs> not even a thing. You don't have to worry about it. All right. Drew, tell us about the two types of aircraft that can be used for the training. Um, and interestingly, yeah, go ahead and just tell, tell us your experience there. Yeah, so I, I had, at the time of my check ride, I had next to zero complex time. So again, complex is retractable landing gear, um, constant speed propeller, and uh, controllable flaps, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I had very little complex time. Um, I did, however, have a bunch of time in a TAA, let's say technically advanced aircraft. So um, a TAA has to have an electronic um, primary flight display that has all the flight instruments. You know, think about the conventional six pack. All those instruments are contained into this, the PFD. Um, you also have to have a, a, a moving map GPS. And also you have to have a two axis autopilot. So the RV-12 uh, satisfies that requirement. It has all those things. Um, one of the 172s that I have a bunch of time in also met the requirements as well. So, uh, you know, I, I had that time pretty much organically just from flying those airplanes ahead of the, ahead of the check ride. So that was, that was great. Um, but yeah, back in the day, you had to do it in a, in a complex or nothing, basically. And if just for the folks out there too, there is an article, there's a link in the handout. It says it's in fact the title of it is technically advanced aircraft. I think, what is it? So there's a whole bunch of details in that AOPA article that we got for you. Dan? Just quick question on that topic. Is the check ride in the training, are there any differences between that complex or technically advanced aircraft requirement? Like, can you do your training in one, but have to do the check ride in another? Or is there any difference in those at all? No, no. it's like, yeah, you did all yours, and I know you did it over time, but when you did yours, yeah. you just did it in the RV-12, correct? Yep, yeah, so the, if you look at the regs, um, it, it just says that you have to have a, a minimum amount of time in those airplanes, right? And I think we looked it up, it was 2018 is when, the, is when the rule changed. Yes, and yeah, it's just so, 10 hours of training in that type of aircraft. 10, sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, it, so yeah, I think you can technically take it in anything. I, I know um, we, we were... Um, um, Jason Blair mentioned that he did a commercial check ride in a in a Stinson. Um, you know, so you can you can do it in pretty much any airplane as long as you satisfy the requirements of the regs for experience and and, and training. And I see a quick question here. I just saw pop up. It says, "Does TAA also include 201 horsepower?" It doesn't have to. TAA can no. just be anything that meets those requirements. Or if you are over 200 horsepower, that too. So it's not required. So it's yeah. whatever engine. I guess as long as it's working is the key part. I, I mean, it would be really fun to fly an RV-12 with 200 horsepower, but again, cause that's it. it's, <laughs> oh it's, it's a light sport, so it has to have 100 horse. <laughs> or, what or about lower. what about is there a requirement for aircraft with full dual controls, like um, which would exclude like a Bonanza with a throwover yoke? That huh. is, uh, and actually, I looked that one. I actually, I didn't look it up. I happened to come across that when I was prepping for this. So when it comes to that one, it's it's in the and I I, I am. It's either in the regs or it's in the ACS. I forget which one where it is, but it's up to the examiner. So the examiner needs to have ready access to the controls. Uh, and so when it comes to a throwover yoke, um, and the audience I know can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but it would be up to the examiner. Uh, I know there's a special reg about the throwover yoke, and I haven't read that one in a while, so I have to go back and look. But it's going to be up to your examiner to talk about that. Interesting. Yeah, here right. I am telling people to get get the rating in their bonanzas, and they may not be able to because it's, it's a throwover. Well, again, it's up to the examiner, but it's like they need ready access to the control, so the examiner may not want to do it with a throwover yoke. Sure. Um, all right. So somebody's asking about the articles. It's in the handout. Uh, for us, the way I see it is in that little menu that we've got for GoToWebinar. Um, it's there's a little thing, and it's just a section called handouts. You just open that up and see it. Uh, maybe Stephen can help out uh, Elizabeth there with that question. Um, and then one one last thing you need to be eligible, um, Chris, is to take the chalks off of your nose wheel before you <laughs> before you go. So just keep you know check ride jitters. I, I I've I've been there. So <laughs> I, I like to leave one wing tied down because then when you can do turns around a tie down, it's a it's a good ground maneuver to practice. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. And in fact, I know that Scott, uh, our, our glider aficionado, uh, he mentioned too, it's like, hey, you don't even need a medical to do a commercial on a glider. So good hey, recognition yeah. there. That's a good tip. Um, hot air balloon as well, I believe. So, okay. Let's talk about the aeronautical experience, the time that you're going to need to get this. Now, 
For the next two slides, you'll see that I put C61129 for details on this one. I mentioned another reg on the next one. We are not trying to be comprehensive because it would not fit on yeah. it. We already have a ton of stuff on here, as you can see. So please go to the regs and look at the requirements. Um, so for the more, you know, more broken down detail. But here is my attempt at a summary to try to hopefully make it clear uh, and to make it relatively simple. And this is for an airplane. So Drew, you can walk us down if you like. What do you think? The first thing is how many, how much total time? Yeah, 250 hours total time, 100 hours of that's PIC. So if you're an active, you know, hobbyist pilot like myself, over over the years, you're going to accumulate that pretty easily. Um, now, moving on, so the cross-country time, you have to make sure it's, it, it satisfies the requirements of being a cross-country flight, which there's a there's a distance requirement, straight line distance requirement. Um, so so make sure you you do satisfy that. I mean, I've, I've heard horror stories of, of a DP rejecting someone's logged flight time because the, the distance between the two airports was just 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 under the uh the the required distance so so make sure you pay attention to that and again if you're out there using your 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 license to travel and if you're in a flying club you know you're, you're going to be doing those longer trips because it's much easier to access the airplane um you know you'll, you'll probably have that cross-country time in spades now this is where it gets a little bit tricky so the 20 hours of training uh, the, the reg is very eloquently written so make sure you read through how they say this stuff um you need 10 hours of instrument training now I had my instrument rating um, going into this. So I'm like, oh, pff, I've, I've got that, right? Well, when you look into it, how it's logged is very important. And it, it may be difficult or impossible to double dip on some of your lessons. So you know, review that very carefully with your instructor. And we're going to talk more about, about that in a little bit. Um, like we talked about the last slide, you need 10 hours of complex or TAA time. And then you also need a uh, two hour. That's training, by the way. Sorry, that's 10 yes. hours of training in a complex yes. or a TAA. Yep. yep. Yep, um, and you need so you also need a dual two-hour, 200 nautical mile day and night cross country. So two separate cross country flights. Uh, guess guess which one of those flights I did the week before my check ride, Chris? Because <laughs> <laughs> you realize you didn't have that one. And by yep. the way, you, when you go to look in the regs too, you'll see that it says 100 nautical mile. The reason that I say greater than 200 because it says it needs to be 100 nautical miles straight line distance away from your departure. So in other words the entire thing's got to be greater than 200 nautical miles or i didn't i was trying not i couldn't fit all that in the bullet so sure. that's when, when you see that and that's the one i'm talking about here all right go ahead yeah so i i did my night cross my dual night cross country the week before my check ride and interestingly i had that that dual cross country i'd done that um during my private pilot training we when we did our dual night cross country for the private pilot license it happened to be over 100 nautical miles but i i consulted with the folks over in PIC and they, you know, there's, there's like some language in there that says you have to be a licensed pilot or you have to be pilot in command or there's, there's some like caveat that you have to, you can't use the stuff you did in primary training for some of these requirements. So just be very careful about that. You don't want to go show up at your check ride and miss one of these key requirements and have, have a discontinuance. Exactly. Um, and go ahead. Yeah. So moving then, on, the fun part that you get to do on your own is the solo stuff. There is that long 300 nautical mile uh, cross country, 250 nautical mile straight line distance. Um, I did mine. Mine was pretty fun. I got to fly a, a, an RV-12 from Wichita, Kansas to Frederick, Maryland. So check. That's a little that, more. That, that, yeah, yeah. I think I think I met the requirement. Um, it has to be solo. A number. I mean, you know, most of us like to fly with friends and family, right? And you know, that's if we're if we're doing a longer trip, it's probably going to be with someone else, right? So this is where that integrity piece of being a pilot comes in. You know, sure you didn't log it, or sure you know it's the, the person's not a pilot, and you know you were the sole pilot on board the airplane. But the the regs are pretty clear that you have to ha be the sole occupant of the airplane for that cross country. So just to, just an integrity piece there, but but make sure you have that. Go ahead, Dan. Does a biannual flight review in a complex or TAA aircraft count towards the requirement for TAA training? I would think so, right? Because it's it's training. It's training time. It's yeah. Log so, tool. Yeah. So it, so this is one where it's like I'm at 100% sure. No, but I'm probably 95% sure that that would count. Um, if you want to verify that, you see that as well. This is a perfect segue because look at the phone number at the bottom of the slide. When you have specific questions, you're trying to like suss some of these things out. Give us a call at 1-800-USA-AOPA. That's the um, uh, pilot information center. So they can they deal with this kind of stuff all the time. So they can help you research that one. But yeah, I'm I'm 95% sure that that should count as long as. This is one of the weird things. It has to be after your private because before you had your private, 
that was you were not a pilot in command sort of thing so there's a whole yep. there's, there's some of the regs talk about the fact that training has to be done after that as i, I found also want to hit yeah and, yes and i want to hit the question too because i saw a couple of people, several people asking do you have to have your instrument rating to get your commercial no you do not you do not have to have your instrument rating however there is a limitation that gets put on you in the and it's in the regs it's under those uh the the 61 120s as i mentioned or maybe into up into that 130 part but there is a, a limitation on your commercial certificate if you do that um, yep. and it has to do with carrying passengers and stuff so yeah it's like yeah and, and i think you can't do it at night or something yeah so i, I don't know i'm not i'm instrument rated so i don't have to worry about that as much but but yeah again if you're a hobbyist pilot that just wants to take your skills up another level don't worry about getting your instrument rating obviously Getting your instrument rating is rewarding and that will also make you a safer pilot, but don't let that hold you back if that's just not your thing to go ahead and get that commercial. Um, one last thing I want to hit on, and this one I really had to kind of dig through my logbook to, to piece together, but the, the 10 takeoffs and landings at Towered Airport at night. So make yes. sure you have that. Um, just go out a couple of nights in the winter time probably because it gets dark so early and, and you know, bust out those night landings and get them logged. Yes. And in fact, I'm just like, I'll, I'll see if, if I'm in, in the interim here, I'll see if I can find that reg about that. I'll try to look it up. Anyway, the big thing, and I know Drew, you already mentioned it when it comes to getting that, uh, that time, be careful on double dipping on your experience. If you want clarification, give us a call here at AOPA uh, at the Pilot Information Center, and they can help you understand some of that, because you had to suss some of that stuff out of your experience as well oh, yeah. uh, in getting ready. All right, let's see how we're doing on time. Let's go ahead and let's keep moving here. And don't worry. We would, we're just trying to stay on time so we can end officially at one, but we will stick around until at least or till 1.30, answering any questions that come up. Um, but this is one that I wanted to make sure we talked about is that there is a common misunderstanding when it comes to the commercial that now I could just go fly and earn money now that I've got my commercial. And that is not true. Um, there are some limitations on what we can do, mainly because of the fact that the FAA is looking to protect the general public. So in other words, just because you get your commercial doesn't mean now I can start a charter operation. There are special regs for charter operations, 135, 121 for scheduled airline operations, all that sort of stuff. So that is not true. So here are the things, and in fact, I shouldn't say the things, here are some of the things yeah. that you can do with your commercial. Please go to 119.1 subparagraph E, that's going to be the one that I'll go into further detail. Again, I was trying to not make it super complicated because there's a couple extra things they've got in there. But Drew, you want to tell us about some of the things you're allowed to do once you get your commercial and make money doing? Yeah, I mean, there's there's you know just different fly for pay jobs that are listed here. I mean, not really much to say there. If you know, if, if an opportunity arises, again, this is someone you know paying you to to do this task in an airplane, right? And you'll you'll learn very quickly in your commercial training how the airplane's provided and you know how how you're hired to do certain things especially carry passengers can very very quickly get complicated and there's a really good guide um a, a youtube video in the in the handout that talks about compensated flying and we're going to talk about that uh, on the next slide too but that that really breaks down very well what's allowed and what's not and what could you know you can very easily very quickly get into illegal charters which is something the fa is, is working hard to crack down on and, and something that we talked about quite a bit on my check ride Oh, and by the way, thank you, Drew. And then I saw that somebody just posted the thing I was just talking about, that limitation on the instrument. Uh, and they're saying here, let's see if I, oh, it's, I could try to make it bigger if I could see it. But they found it at 61133, commercial pilot privileges and limitations. And there's the part in there that talks about um, the limitation if you do not have your instrument rating. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, that said, so yeah, you get to do uh, all this other, all these other types of operations and um, you know, check it out. But there is, and in fact, there are more than this. Like I said, by the way, for example, the helicopter ops has a bunch of specific stuff underneath of it that I didn't want to try to copy out. It's a big paragraph. Go check it out. Um, but let's talk also, because this is the, one of the other parts too, is that even with some of these things, you've got to be careful because there is a thing called holding out and common carriage that is a major limitation that as commercial pilots, uh, you need to be, yeah, exactly. I saw Paul's there saying, illegal charters, don't be that guy, exactly. <laughs> That's what we're about to talk about, yep. is this idea of illegal charters, basically, and the idea of common carriage. So there is an AC advisory circular, it's down at the bottom of the slide. It's also a link to that in the handout. Um, and I also provided a link to a sample letter of interpretation from the FAA. Yep. Lots of discussion about this, 120-12A. So Drew, Freshly minted commercial pilot, can I just go out and start advertising? Hire me, I will take you for a flight. Can you do that? 
No, and that and it's funny, right? I I thought you know you have this like this this image in your mind of being a commercial pilot. You have have commercial pilot certificate will fly for cash, right? You think it's going to open up all these doors when really most of what you're talking about, especially on the check ride, is what you can't do as a commercial pilot. So you know, and, and again, this is talking about the external pressures, right? There are going to be people that will make you an offer that might be pretty enticing, but you have to go you have to be able to know where in the regs I can go to find out if this is going to be legal or not. And um, a lot of times, just because it, it may sound like a pretty sweet gig, it might be an illegal charter. So you have to be very aware of that. And, you know, again, like Chris said, this is to protect the public, right? We're, we're, we're trying to keep the public safe here. So that's why we have all these, these crazy regs. They're not crazy, but all these intricate regulations around compensated um, flying of passengers. And so one of the things that I'll say right there to that effect as well, because the people have, of course, I've trained uh, lots of commercial pilots and everything else. And so one of the things that the way I like to explain it is when it comes to the regs, it, it really comes down to, you know, if you know the person, this is a family member, you're allowed to like take them flying and do whatever, right? But yeah. as you get to the point where you're taking people that don't know you and think about it in terms of the FAA, if you personally, like this person knows you, they should know well enough to do I trust their judgment to take me up flying in an airplane. So there's that part. But the general public has no idea, nor do they understand anything about airplanes. And so as you get into that thing of getting into charters and airlines and everything else, the regs become much more restrictive because they've got safety requirements and operational requirements. And that's why as you move up into those professional parts, are actual there's goes beyond just having personal minimums to regulated minimums for flying and that's kind of this is in that same theme so this yep. idea of common carriage there's the definition common carriage is you're holding out a willingness to transport persons or property from place to place for compensation and it has to have all four of those things to be what's called common carriage common carriage is regulated by the fa that's when you get into your part 135 part 121 and this idea of holding out, as Drew was already talking about too, can be done in a bazillion different ways. So a lot of times people think it's just me advertising, but the key part here is that it could be as simple as if everybody knows that Drew will take you like, oh, hey, you know what? It's kind of like on the, on the on the down low. Hey, go talk to Drew. It's like he's got a plane and he'll fly you. Just give him a little bit of cash. That is enough to be called holding out. So even if you never say to anybody or advertise, just the fact that everybody knows that Drew will do it, that's holding out, and now you're in trouble with the FAA. So don't do that. There's, really there's a great careful. song about, about legal char charters called Treetop Flyer, if you've ever heard it. <laughs> <laughs> I have not heard that one. Oh, you that, gotta look it up. Is, it's great. Uh, um, I will have to check that one out. But but yeah, also so again, check out my friend Dan's video about about um compensated flying. It really does a good job of breaking it down for you, especially for check ride prep. Go ahead, Dan. N not me, friend Dan. Another. Friend oh yeah, Dan. sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Just a point of clarification. There were there were a few questions, notes about. Um, you had mentioned that uh, with a commercial certificate, you're you're eligible then to teach others to fly, but it's not that you Correct. you need to have your your CFI yes. uh, to do that. So a, a, you you don't need a CFI uh, certification for a commercial license, but you do need the opposite to be able to provide act as a CFI. You do need to have your commercial certificate. I think the one exception to that, and again, 95% sure I have to go dig into the regs again, but I believe with the balloons, you are allowed to train people in uh, balloons with a commercial. I don't think there's a balloon CFI. Oh, and I think the same with a blimp as airships as well. I don't think they don't require CFIs either. Is it gliders too, perhaps? Commercial glider? No, gliders. There's a, a CFI G. I'm hoping to someday earn that one. Nice. Um, but yeah, the, the glider CFI is, that is a CFI certificate. You need to have that one. So, okay. Let's go ahead and our last slide. We're, we're doing well here. We're doing on, we're right on time. We'll be able to answer all the questions. Um, and by the way, just to clarify that, just to go back to that one, uh, several people asked about that instrument, you know, if you don't have an instrument rating with your commercial, the limitation basically is you're not allowed to carry passengers for hire beyond 50 nautical miles from your departure, and the uh, nighttime flying passengers at night is also prohibited, so that's 61, 133, yep. bravo under limitations. Okay. So, um, and guys, please correct me if I'm wrong on any of that stuff, because I know you folks know a lot of stuff out there as well. Um, but Tips for the check ride. So Drew, walk walk us down because some of these are coming from I know your own experience, and I'll share some sure. of mine as well. Sure. Yeah. So so get the, get all the requirements done before you start your training, so that you know less things are just like you want to get your written done before you get really serious about your your private training. That's one tactic, right? Removing barriers, removing obstacles to get to that to get you to that check ride, right? So make sure you have all that done, and then early on. 
um, sit down with, with a good CFI, which I know Chris has some points on, but sit down with your CFI and go through, hey, here's what I think satisfies these requirements. And they're going to know right away um, if you if you have the requ all the requirements satisfied or not. And, it, you know, it may take a couple of flights a week before your check, right? Like like I did. So, so you know, <laughs> just, um, not. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Um, it, but, you know, it was, it was all good. It was a, it was a good flight. Um, so, yeah, and also, you know, using an organized syllabus, right? So it's it's good to, to work through this stuff. The nice thing about about the commercial is a lot of the prep can be done solo. So work with your CFI, do, you know, however many lessons you need to get comfortable, at, you know, decently comfortable with the maneuvers, and you know what, a good, what, what the maneuvers look like when they're flown well, and then you can go out and practice on your own. So that's a, it's a good way to, to stay sharp. It doesn't have to always, every lesson doesn't have to be dual if you don't want to, um, just like with your with your instrument rating, right? You, you get a foundation with a CFI and then you go out and practice with a safety pilot or on the sims. Um, it's, it's just a good good way to, to work on that stuff and sharpen your skills and get ready for the check ride. Um, Absolutely, and by the way, I did provide uh, some links. I found two uh free uh examples of syllabus commercial syllabus online and so those are in the handout as well by the way i know i saw people asking about the handout too if if you're watching this later on youtube not during this live presentation it'll be available down in the comments steven i'll put a link um in nice. there i'll have that put in all right keep going so that's i have i'll take the good cfi one really quick yeah, here yeah. what do i mean by a good cfi uh, to me, what a good CFI is, is one that's going to kick your butt. Because for me, the best teachers I ever had were the ones that pushed me and made me work hard because I learned a lot more from them. So go find the one that's going to push you a little bit. Uh, and I don't mean in a mean way, but they're going to challenge you and they're going to hold you to standards, right? They're going to say like, you know, even though the 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 ACS might say plus or minus 100, our goal is plus or minus zero. It's like get on it and stay on it. If we say we're going to land on that spot, land on that spot. So find that good CFI that's number one, going to push you. But number two has that organized instruction, which goes back to the idea of a syllabus. So those are the two main things that I look for in a CFI. One that's going to really hold me to standards in a nice way, but challenge me and hold me to it and, and be organized in their instruction. Let's talk a little bit about the written test prep. So what are some recommendations? I know I've got my views, but uh, and Drew, you did it um, in different ways. So let's talk about the two, kind of, I think, two ways of going about this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I did it. I got the, I, I like the, the Glime stuff. So I did, I did go through the Glime books as like a kind of like a, you know, I read through all that and like read through the materials and stuff. Um, I did use Shepherd Air to, to prepare for the, for the exams as well, just to get them done. But I used the Glime to really reinforce that knowledge. You know, there's, there's, there's tactics, there's a tactics of passing the exam with Shepherd Air, but you really do need to fill backfill knowledge to make sure you really understand the topics for the check ride. So that's kind of how I did it. Um, and obviously I, you know, there's, there's, it's so great. We're, we're, we're living in a great age with a ton of information out there. Not all of it's good information, especially on YouTube and stuff like that. But you know, you know, find some, Except find some stuff. good our stuff on YouTube. Yeah, awesome. yeah, right. yeah. This stuff is great. Good stuff here. Good stuff. No. Um. So you know, there, there are some good resources online, and you know, finding, finding trustworthy sources that you can, that you learn well from, um, is a great tool. So that's kind of how I, how I kind of like hodgepodge it together a little bit. And so, and I, I know a lot of folks like to use that, uh, that one that kind of like Chubber kind of drills you on the questions. Um, for me, the way that I prefer to do it now, I'm old school because I like the paper book, although I do like electronic stuff too. Um, but some people will use things like, um, you know, the online versions provided by King Schools, Jeppesen, uh, uh, Sporties, that sort of thing. And also, or the paper books are still available. I personally really like the ASA stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of similar to the Glime, but what I like to do with those paper books is that I'll go through and I would make my first pass through just going and answering the questions that I already knew. Um, and then I would just mark those off. Like I got that one and I would do like a three sort of three, um, signs on it. One would be like a check mark. I got this one. Like I'm totally confident. I know that one, not worried about it. The, the, the other one I would use is kind of like one where it was a question mark, um, where I was kind of like, I kind of know it, but I was sketchy about it. Like I got it right, but I wasn't confident. So I would leave that for review again. And then I had the ones where I was like, I totally don't get this and go look it up. What I personally like to do with folks that are training, uh, if it works for you, uh, and it kind of leads into our next topic here in a second, is to make sure you really understand, like Drew said, have the understanding, because to me, um, I don't want to just, I don't like the people just have people drill stuff. Cause to me, that's not yeah. worthwhile. Understand it. Cause now that's useful for you later when you get to the oral exam and not more importantly, when you're flying and, and understanding the airplane. So go for that understanding because really, if you understand the topic, well, except for a few exceptions, cause there are bad FAA questions out there, believe it or not. 
But for the most part, understanding what? it leads to deeper knowledge. And I think that's the most valuable thing. Now, we both recommended this idea of schedule, plan. And I think I was even thinking as you were talking about getting that time done ahead of time, what's the most efficient way to get this thing done? What do you think, Drew? This, this next as, bullet? As quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> just just fly fly a lot fly all the time and um you know keep keep things sharp because as you know at, you know as a commercial pilot you know you can get rusty you're not inf infallible right so you know just just be focused make the time and and just just you know hammer it out get get out there and do it and and by the way um in the handout we do have the acs for the commercial pilot and it yep. covers all the different commercial ratings you can get but study that read that I, I used to i would have it in the in the flight deck with me just like to reference when i do you know just to, just so i could make sure i was within the specs um so just read through that and, and understand what each maneuver what the parameters are so knowing that ahead of time and just kind of internalizing that will, will help you be a more precise pilot and, and will help you get more out of your training i think and in fact to just to, to paraphrase um a former colleague of mine so keith i want to give you credit on this one he said that one of the things when it came to both the written test and I'd even say for the check ride as well, is that prepping for a check ride is like having a bucket with a hole in it. You're filling it with water. And so the idea is to fill it with as much water as possible before it drains out. And that's why this idea of being efficient and having a plan so you can be really focused and concentrated with it is going to take you less time and money overall than sort of eking it out. All right, Dan, if you would, let me just officially end the webinar here and then okay. we'll hit all these questions. I, I can see them all. I can't read them as we're going. Can't wait. Um, but <laughs> we will we will do as many as we can. Um, so real quick, what we want to do is let's go to the official end of the webinar for the folks that have to log off because they may be at work and on the lunch break and we appreciate you joining us. But really quick, um, we have our AOPA pilot password. Now, by the way, wings credit. If you gave us the email that you use, if you register with that email for fahsafety.gov, you don't have to do anything. You're good to go. We're going to get you wings credit. If you um, aren't sure about that, then I know that Stephen's been getting messages. I've seen him in the chat here. Or you can email us at ftinitiative at aopa.org. That's FT Foxtrot Tango Initiative at aopa.org. Uh, and we can help you out with that. But Stephen, tell us about this pilot passport thing that we've got. Okay, I'll try to keep it brief. It is embedded as part of the AOPA app. Uh, it is a way to go in, find airports local to you. It sorts them by range based upon the, uh, the GPS settings you have on your device. And it gives details, information, and you can check in when you get within, I believe it's three miles of the airport. Um, it does count vertically as well. Um, <laughs> nice. I tried it once, actually. It works. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you can check in, you earn badges, uh, it gives you points for going to the different airports and visiting them. It's, it's very much like the um, little passport books that some of the states do for visiting different air airports around your state. Um, so it gamifies a little bit, gives you kind of make some fun out of it. And our marketing folks do a contest every once in a while based upon the points thing too. So there's ways to win some prizes from us if you, you do your regular check-ins. Okay. And then, by the way, um, Stephen also has the directions right on there. So uh, you just step your way through it. So if you're going into that app, you're going to click on the menu. Then you're going to click Pilot Passport, My Pilot Passport. And then it'll have a little spot there, Redeem Affiliate Code. And that's what you do. I had a request, uh, somebody threw in the, the chat there um, to please put in. I'll see if I can put this. Actually, Stephen, I'm not sure what exactly where to put that. Can you put the code in the chat for them so they can cut and paste the code into their app? I can do that. Um, all right, also, awesome. thank you. Also be advised, I think when they set this feature up, uh, they weren't expecting the kind of traffic that we generate. So you might get an error message because everyone's hitting the button all at the same time. It, it's the server being overloaded. Maybe give it hey, a few minutes to try again later, it'll work. We love our Don't Get Rusty audience because you guys are enough that you overload the app. I love it. So um, yeah, if you, if you do that happens, just make sure you come back a little later to that app. And try we're, like the, we're like the ticket master of AOPA <laughs> webinars. <laughs> <laughs> all right, really quick. Um, the official end next month, April 20, 2023, uh, 12 to 1, as always, on a Thursday. We're going to do Roger, Roger, and by popular demand, because we did that non-towered episode earlier this year, cleared for what? Towered operations. We're going to talk about best practices in towered operations. So that's it. I'm going to leave the code up here for a little longer. Uh, and Dan? Hit us up. What are these questions? So many questions. So many questions. Not enough time. Uh, but let's talk a little bit. A couple came up about um, is is the is there instrument approaches on a commercial check ride? No. Well, okay. depends. Okay. So on okay. a single right. engine, 
So if you're doing a single engine commercial, like your initial commercial check ride, there are no instrument approaches because you've already done those for your instrument check ride. However, if you're doing your um, adding your multi on, which a lot of people will do, adding a multi engine with a commercial, then there are instrument approaches on that one because you got to do them single engine and everything. So mm. so it depends. So keep that in mind. I was okay. all confident with the no. <laughs> That's, That's good. So to log or uh, to use a safety pilot, um, it says, does an instrument safety pilot need to be instrument rated to log time as a safety pilot? No, as long no. as they're as long as they're certificated, right? They ha you have to have your certificate. Um, but you know, obviously, you, you you're not going to be fine in in IMC in the instrument me um, meteorolo meteorological conditions. You know, you're in VFR weather, so they're just there to watch for traffic and keep you safe. So you no, know, as long as they as they're rated for VFR, you're fine. Right. So the big thing is you just need to be qualified as pilot in command for that aircraft because effectively you're taking over. Well, you're not taking over the controls, but you're acting. Uh, in some sense, let me be careful about that. You may, if designated, act as pilot in command, but you need to be able to take the controls and act as pilot in command if needed. So okay. I hope that's a good way around all the regs. So. Yep. <laughs> Question on uh, commercial pilot privileges: Can a private pilot provide a free flight to someone for their birthday? Uh, or similarly, could you uh, provide a flight as a gift for a nonprofit silent auction, something like that? Yeah, so we're Good. this is uh, this is something I'm, I'm really into. I'm I'm very passionate about you know volunteer flying and I'm, I'm I I love flying young eagles and stuff. Um, I will say most of this stuff you have to be very careful. Um, things like tax write-offs and you know even flight experience can be considered compensation for mm -hmm. your flight time, right? So just because you're doing it, you're still paying for it. That still could be contrived as a, a of, uh, as a compensation just be, so i just want to say be very careful with that stuff um one of the things that we talk about is a common purpose so if you're flying a friend to uh to long island new york for example right and you have no reason to go to long island that is not a common purpose you are flying that you basically are doing it providing a service to your friends so that could be considered you know compensation so it, it's 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 tricky but you know if you're just going up for a joy ride that's that's just standard part 91 stuff you're, you're fine um but when you start adding on those layers of well this is for a charity this is for for something like someone's benefiting besides me from this flight um that's when it gets it gets very tricky so um look up charitable flying um if you're interested in doing something like that i i was i i went down that path i was going to um, raffle off a flight and donate all the money to a, to a charity and quickly found out that that was illegal so I, just be very cautious about that stuff, even if you have your commercial. And I'd recommend if you just Google AOPA charitable flying, we have an entire guide for that. If you've got detailed questions, give us a call at 1-800-USA-AOPA, the Pilot Information Center. They'll be able to help you out as well. So yeah, be careful about all that stuff because you don't want to get in trouble with the FAA. Um, and that idea of compensation, Drew, is exactly right. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm trying to think if there's another thing I was going to add on to that. I don't think so. I'll stop my head. Oh, I know what it was. The handouts. Make sure you check the handout because I have two things in there for you. Um, the 119, uh, oh, sorry, it was, uh, yeah, it has the stuff about 119 and the regs. And there's the part on, there's an AC on uh, that common carriage stuff that we talked about and holding out. And then there's uh, one letter of interpretation. There are more than that. Um, so just I just got you that link to get you in that right direction. So this is a huge topic. It gets down deep, and we didn't it's want a, to try to cover all that here. It's a rabbit hole for sure. <laughs> there yes. were so many questions about medical certificates and commercials. So just to revisit that one more time, uh, this one was loud and clear on how it was explained. So can you obtain a commercial with basic med? Absolutely. Yes. Mostly yes. <laughs> um, there was check out the article there's a link I put in there it's from a pilot protection services um, again when I was trying to access it yesterday sometimes it was giving me a cloud flare error and then other times it was working fine but there is an article uh, there and it talks about it and the, the reason I say that is of course we're talking now to the attorneys and they will never give an absolute answer on anything um, because there's always there's always contingencies right so check out the article but in general, yeah, you can get your commercial using basic med, but check out the article for anything that might preclude that for some reason. But in overall, yeah. you're good to go. Getting it's, the rating is fine. The privileges, though, is where, where you invoke the second class and first class. Right. Gotcha. Good. Okay. A lot of notes about getting commercial certificates so they could tow gliders, um, give rise in gliders. Um, so that was touching on what you were talking about there, Chris, um, about 
you know, what is really required for, for glider pilot CFI's commercial glider um, on that. As I'm paging through here, we got those. Um, higher standard, we talked about that. Um, aerial photography pipeline, all of that is available as a commercial pilot, great opportunities there. Yeah. Um, we talked about recommendations for the oral. I did have a question on um, on a syllabus, like uh, for training for the commercial certificate. Any recommendations there are recommendations on how to find a good one for, for individuals? Honestly, uh, well, I, I gave two, the reason I gave the two examples that are in there, I think one was from uh, ASA, uh, one was from, uh, I'm trying to remember the other one, I can't remember off the top of my head. Anyway, there's links there. The only reason I picked those two out is because they were free, you could download them for free. The other ones when I was looking, um, you had to, like, had to pay some sort of fee for it to, to buy them. But what I would generally say is pretty much any of those large um, publishers out there, Jeppesen, ASA, King Schools, um, uh, what else is I mean, missing? Sporties. Sporties they're yeah. going to have a good syllabus, and I would I would tend to trust. Like if you go to a CFI and they're already using a syllabus, they have and Glime is another one. Um, they already have probably vetted out the one that they like to use. Um, and so I like to I like for me I like to see an integration between ground and flight. I don't like doing all the ground and then all the flight because they do go together. Um, and so if you, you're going to look for something like that. So. So yeah, I'd, I would trust your CFI. It's like, you know, and sometimes they may, a school, a good school may have even developed their own version, uh, their own syllabus for it, so. Cool, yeah. Can any CFI do commercial training or do they need to be a double I? Double I is just for instrument training. That's an instrument instructor. So any CFI can do a commercial. Yes, okay. but, but not a, need to it's do... a double I only, they can't. Well, yeah, and right. uh, yeah, that's a good point. But also for the instrument training, that has to be with a double I. So for the for the 10 hours of instrument training that's required in the regs, that has to be with a double I. Everything else can be with a, a standard CFI. There you go. Okay. All right, Why by the way, is Shandell yeah. considered a max performance maneuver? Can I say it through or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So the reason it's a max, and actually I know somebody mentioned they were talking about, because I drew you used the example of a, of a canyon turn. I would not recommend using a chandelle to get out of a canyon. Okay, first of so all, I, I get excited about chandelles. You know, I, I think know. it's, I, I just, that's, that's my first reaction to anything. It's up chandelle, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. I got to go around chandelle. Yeah. Um, so, no, don't do that. Um, the reason, the Shondell actually is an old maneuver. It started, I think, World War One, and it yeah, had to do with yep. them turning and climbing. So it's it really what it is, it's max performance because you are trying to get the most amount of climb while doing that turn in the 180. You're trying to get the max climb performance out of it in doing this maneuver and sort of putting the airplane right to its limits. That's sort of the idea. So that's why it's called maximum performance because you are, you're starting, I think we started, if I, if, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been a while since I've done one, but I, uh, the Shondell, you're starting around maneuvering speed typically, somewhere around yeah. there, and yeah, it's like it's cruise maneuvering speed, speed, depending on the yeah. airplane. And you're ending up right above the stall, so uh, you know, literally, you want that stall. Ideally, you want the stall warning horn just going ding ding as you're as you're ending it. That's when you know you've nailed it. Yep. While staying coordinated. <laughs> okay, I'm paging through these. We've covered a lot, a lot of duplication on these questions. Um, I was using a DA40, so constant speed prop, power flap, fixed gear. Not considered complex. I think that's, that's not complex. That's no, correct. correct. It has to be retractable yeah. gear. Yeah. Right. So okay. get the uh, the was it the DA62, whatever that new fancy diamond is. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have this gear up, up and down. I saw a bunch of people ask it too. Um, they were one person popped up after we mentioned the charitable part because we talked about not compensation. Private pilots are able to do charitable flying, but yes. it's within these limits. Um, I don't know those off the top of my head. I don't know if you do, Drew, but it's like, that's why I check out the guides. Do you happen to know, Drew, what the limits are? And if you don't, it's okay. We can refer yeah, to the guide. Yeah, I, I don't want to you know, speak out of turn or, or speak, speak wrong. Look it up. If, if you're considering charitable flying, a lot of these these places, um, you know, there's the Air Care Alliance. They have a lot of very helpful training and they, they link you right to AOPA's charitable flying training. But there's there's the, you know, the safe side of it and then there's the legal side of it. So just make sure what you're doing is, is in line Generally speaking, if you're doing something out of the goodness of your own heart, um, you're not getting any you know tax write-offs or you're not being compensated for fuel or anything like that. You're you're probably going to be okay, but just double check. Um, so you know that the charitable flying, you know, um, uh, pilots and paws, e young eagle flights, uh, the um, 
uh, the mercy flights and things like that. Just make sure you you're you're clear on all that before you before you go go on there. Um, I, a lot of times, you know, for some of those flights, especially when you're carrying people, they do require instrument ratings and and sometimes commercial. So just just uh, just look that up beforehand. One person I see, Ken, asking about the light sport CFI. Does that require a commercial? It does not. Um, that's a special reg in that sport section. So it's 61403. I just I was able to look it up while Drew was talking. Not that I know that at the top of my head, but it just requires a sport pilot certificate, and that's just different training. So you're a different sort of CFI because um, your 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 privileges only apply to people that are doing sport ratings. It does not apply to um, like somebody right. getting a private or anything else. So that that person can only sign off on someone getting their sport pilot. Right. Right. Interesting. That's cool. Uh, does um, training receive to get the instrument rating count for the 10 hour requirement? Yeah, we, we sure. talked about that. Um, it can, it not necessarily always. And so, you know, be very particular about how you log it. If you if you do have aspirations of getting your commercial down the road after your instrument, um, talk to your CFI about that. And there's ways that you can log it and also perform the training, right? Because you obviously have to satisfy some requirements in inside the instrument training. So mm -hmm. just be very careful about that. And again, don't don't think you can you can double dip everything. Um, and also, if you use the simulator, there's there's some provisions in there as well. So just uh, and take your time. When you were sussing out that stuff out of your logbook, where did you go, Drew, to get the to help somebody to get help with that one? I well, I, I had the privilege of walking over to the Pilot Information Center and talking <laughs> to them. But you can call them, and and you know they're they're so knowledgeable, so experienced, and they'll they'll set you straight. Um, so again, this is why you want to do this. Go through your logbook before you get really thick into the thick of your training, so that you can make sure you have all those requirements satisfied, right? Just make sure that all that stuff's out of the way, and then you can focus on prepping for the check ride. Exactly. And in fact, that number again is 1-800, or sorry, 1-800-USA-AOPA. 1-800-USA-AOPA. Yeah, there great, you great bunch of we folks We had to note that it's, you don't need a commercial certificate to tow gliders, which I think is true, but I think if there's any sort of compensation, right. and then also what does that mean for compensation? What if it's not just money? What if it's flight time in a glider, or are there other considerations there that we need to think about? The big thing there is that <clears throat> this stuff will be found in the regs because it comes under private pilot privileges and limitations. And in there, um, and I'm, 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 I'm looking right now, I could, I seem to remember it saying that you were allowed. Uh, here it is. A private pilot who meets the requirements of 6169, this is under 61113, um, may act as pilot in command of an aircraft towing a glider. So that it says right there that they can do it. Generally speaking, if you don't have a commercial, you're not supposed to be getting compensation. So this is probably just you're doing it because you're helping out the club. Um, when you get into that, and I, I don't know, I, I'd want to defer to some of our, our, our experts like Scott Manley I know is out there. Um, it's like I'd want to defer to them to check into that. But it's like generally speaking, the way that it works is if you're doing it as a private pilot, you're not supposed to be getting compensation. It doesn't mean you can't do it. To get compensation, you need to have your commercial, right? So they get paid or to get compensated. And, and the FAA has seen things like free flight time as compensation. So that's where you got to be careful. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's that's one we do. I would have to dig into that or I would definitely um, talk to your glider club uh, and or give us a call at the one, you know, the uh, Pilot Information Center. 1-800-USA-AOPA. <laughs> I've got one more safety pilot question. Can a basic pilot, basic med pilot be a safety pilot? Oh boy, yeah, that's yeah, um, yes, yeah. There, there's there's some there's a little bit of nuance there, I think, but generally yes. And there are AOPA articles about that that cover that very topic. Yeah. And in fact, I think the nuance you're thinking of is that he used to have to be designated as pilot in command. And I I wish I'd have to go look this up to verify. It either is coming or has already happened that they've taken that requirement away. Now safety pilots, uh, basic med can just be used as safety pilot, even if you're not designated as pilot in command. But please look that one up because I don't know that off the top of my head and it would take me a minute to look that one uh, up to, to verify that, but it is coming. So safe old news is that you get designated as pilot in command while you're safety pilot, you are good to go with basic med. And I know that requirement either has gone away or is going away uh, in the very near future. So, yes, you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. By the way, I saw somebody here mention they had a question about um, reporting a DUI on a medical. That is not one that I know off the top of my head. Um, that's one. Give us a call, 1-800-USA-AOPA. They may defer you uh, or may recommend that you get our legal plan so you can talk to one of our panel attorneys uh, or even the folks that we have here at headquarters. Um, because that's one 
the DUI definitely is a part of, uh, uh, that's important. And I don't know if there's a time limit. I don't, I don't think there is, but I, I, I can't answer that one with any kind of authority. And, you know, if you, it's, it's one thing to get the third class, but when you're talking about second and first class, you know, now you're talking about carrying the general public. So the, 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 the you'd be under the microscope mm -hmm. even more for that kind of stuff. So definitely consult uh, the, the, the experts at the, the PIC and the, and the legal services plan for that stuff. Uh, a right. note uh, from Michael talking about holding out um, common carriage is limitations, not just commercial, but ATPs as well. So, oh, yeah, yeah. of course. You know, just ATPs, of course, ATPs that, rating is just above and beyond the, the commercial. Absolutely. Right. Right. We'll do this again when I get my ATP in, in two years. Right. So, I got to do a flight review. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm awesome. not doing that. <laughs> Ooh, shot, shot, question shot for Stephen. Stephen, question for you, sir. Oh, boy. When will this recording be posted on YouTube? <laughs> uh, I can give an approximation. So ideally, I try to get them downloaded and I'm trying to get it posted by probably late in the day tomorrow. Okay. It does depend on the media team's bandwidth because um, gotcha. they're, they're, down, they're down a few people. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to get everything processed correctly. So if it's not tomorrow, it'll be probably Monday, Tuesday of next week. For some reason, they have not given us the keys to like to edit anything we want on AOPA's website or the YouTube <laughs> channel. So if we actually have um, you know, we actually have limits, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't know why not. they wouldn't trust us. It's not like we wouldn't yeah. do anything. They have not given me the keys to the kingdom, so I have to go through all the proper channels. Yep. <laughs> uh, questions on the night landing requirements. Do they need to be to a full stop or can they be touch and goes? I saw that and I looked it up and the answer is no, because um, I wanted to verify the night the night landing for night currency or 90 yeah. day night currency, that's to a full stop. But okay. for the commercial, it does not say that. So it's, I remember okay. we used to do, and I, I was gonna talk about this when we got to that point, but um, out in Arizona, we would fly around the Phoenix Bravo like underneath of it and there were all these Delta towers. So we would go take off knowing how late they would be open and go and just do landings at each one and just get our 10 landings all knocked out. Um, we would like two landings, I don't know whatever we did, but it was fun. So yes, so cool. you do not have to be to a full stop. And also yeah. related to that, there's not, for that requirement, there's not a currency requirement. It can be done at any point. Once you get your 10 done, you're done. It yeah. doesn't have to be 10 within for this, no. for this satisfaction. Uh, it doesn't yep. need to be 10 within a certain amount of time. Yeah, yeah. not yeah. unless maybe you're doing your check right at night, which most examiners, I can't even imagine trying to do a Shondell at night. Ooh, that's yeah. insane. So yeah. I like Shondells, but not that much. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, that's interesting. And yeah, to that point, you don't have to be night current or even, yeah, yeah, you don't have to be night current to, to take your check ride or anything like that. But the question is right. going to come up, you know, can, as you sit here right now, can you take passengers for hire flying at night? You know, you just have to understand all the regs and how that, how you would apply that to your commercial flying. Sure. Five hours required for VFR flight. Does five hour night IFR count? No, well, if it says five hours for VFR flight and you did it IFR, that is not VFR. So the answer to that is no, you need to go do it VFR. Because remember, the idea here is that you've done all that stuff or you've done um, experience during your instrument rating under the hood or in the clouds, depending, right? But for this, the commercial is, again, taking you to a new level for VFR flying. So that's where the focus is, even though it has some IFR um, or instrument training as part of it. The, the really yeah. the focus is your, your visual flying. Yeah, I've got the reg right here. It says five hours in night VFR conditions with 10 takeoffs mm -hmm. and landings. So yeah, it has to be VFR conditions. Are there any limitations with a commercial rating regarding number of passengers and weight? So yeah. go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if if the aircraft requires a type rating, then you would have to have that. So that would be added to your certificate. But um, so I mean, that, as far as I know, Chris, that's the only reg. And is I mean, when the when the aircraft gets to a certain size that and it requires a type rating, that's where you hit that ceiling. Um, right. And even in 119, it's like when you get into the exemptions under Part E that I mentioned, um, it, right in that reg. So they do this a lot. And so in the reg here, it says, except for operations when common carriage is not involved, which you're allowed to do, with airplanes having a passenger seat configuration of 20 seats or more, excluding any required crew member seat or a payload capacity of 6,000 pounds or more, this part does not apply. So that comes up all the time. And then there are other things when you get into like a type rating, I believe it's 12.5 or a jet. So yeah, you've got to, there are definitely limitations when it comes to size of aircraft. For your typical GA aircraft, though, like your set, your typical Cessna, um, your Pipers, that kind of stuff, you're, it's not going to be a problem. But yeah, when you get into these larger aircraft, that's where there are limitations. 
Gotcha. For the 300 nautical mile cross country, does that require three airports? I believe it does. I think it does say uh, three airports. I don't know. Let's go look that one up. Yeah, I got, I got it right here. So, um, yeah, uh, landing's at a minimum of three points, one of which is a straight line distance of at least 250 nautical miles from the origin, original departure airport. Um, unless you're in Hawaii, but most so, of us aren't in Hawaii. <laughs> let me reiterate, too, on those slides. Remember, I was taking this much regs and trying to put it into this much space. Yeah. So, so please don't take those. Don't take those as the regs. Those are my kind of quick review overview of the regs. Go check out the regs on um, in the commercial stuffs in the 61120s and then up into the 61130s. You'll see there's a section literally called subpart F commercial pilots. It's all in there. So go check out the regs um, when you're going to review this stuff. Please don't use my slides as the regs. They are not. Yeah, don't don't, don't put that out and take that to your check ride, please. <laughs> yes, please don't do that. <laughs> Chris said all we had to do were power off 180s and lazy eights. <laughs> um, I've uh, for the solo long cross country, I've flown flights over 400 nautical miles, but my airplane has short legs, and I need to get fuel every 150 to 200 nautical miles. Do intermediate intermediate fuel stops invalidate the distance, or is it based on departure destination distance? I think, I think it's, it's total. It's total right. distance, right? Yeah. So it doesn't. It yeah. says departure distance. Yeah. In fact, let's let's take a look at that. That'll be under aeronautical experience. We'll get into like yeah. that long one, and it just says landings at a minimum of three points, one of which is a straight line distance of at least 250 nautical miles from original point, and then there's an exception for Hawaii because they can't do that. Yeah. So um, the whole but, flight uh, yeah. is is over 300 nautical miles, and you know, the furthest away airport is is at least 250. Then yeah, you'd be you'd be fine. But it's the not, only thing. Not you don't need to have a leg that's 250 miles. No. Like you could no. do intermediate it stops to say that. Up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It doesn't say. It. Now, the one thing that I know that because Drew mentioned he did that flight from um, Kansas with the RV all the way back to Frederick. Um, be careful there because it's like I, I would think that the examiners be looking at in one day. So it's not like you should be like, well, I took this flight this day and then three days later I took this flight. There's my commercial credit. No. Yeah. On the same day. I'm pretty sure they're going to. Yeah. So that. mine was over over um, the span of a few days and I, I ran that by a couple of by, by our, uh, you know, um, probably the PIC folks and also another DPE. And, you know, it, it was obvious that that was the same trip. So, I mean, there, there weren't flights in between or anything like that. It was, it was, it was, the purpose was to get the plane from A to B and that's, that's all I logged and all I did. So they, they were fine with that. Yeah. I'd imagine you would have done more than 300 nautical miles in one day anyway, when you're flying it back. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. yeah, the RV 12, it sips four gallons of gas. And so you, you've got pretty good, pretty good range in that thing. It's pretty yeah. nice. Especially um, coming westbound or eastbound. Just a quick, uh, quick, quick note on that. The first thing my DPE said to me when he walked in is like, "Are we really doing this in an RV 12?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes. Drew, you mentioned point A to point B with your cross country example there, but uh, fun fact from Ken, uh, always full of those. Thank you, Ken. Uh, the Voyager around the world record 10 day flight did not count as a cross country flight because it took off and landed at the same airport. So it was Whoa. point A to point A. So even though you flew all the way around the world, <laughs> it does not count for cross country time. Oh, I don't think Dick Rattan's hurting for time. No, yeah. I bet you're right. <laughs> there is one exception right. to that for ATP flying for ATP cross country the definition does not require a landing so you could have used it towards atp if you didn't already have it which you probably won't make because i think theirs mm -hmm. is just 50 nautical miles away over you don't have to land mm. so awesome. keep that in mind too and any other ones dan i mean the rest are, are similar to questions that we've already asked um there was one that I think is interesting. Um, if you're not being paid, can you fly under conditions that require commercial? So I wonder if just what does that really mean? Conditions that require commercial, because that's not really a thing. Yeah, I don't yeah. think so. I, I think mean, the big it... part there is the conditions. That again, remember, money is not the only form of compensation as well. Right. So right. it's like if it's like there are people that are like, well, what if I took the airplane and like. I'm not getting paid for it, but this guy had me fly his airplane to ferry it somewhere, right? That's compensation because especially you're probably building time towards some other rating or a job later. So that's the FAA considers that compensation. So you got to be careful. Yeah. So the, big, the biggest thing, and I know Drew, you know this from from talking to the folks that are oftentimes 
get something going with a flying club as well. They're always trying to find ways around the regs, and that's just a bad idea because yeah. the FAA does not see things in shades of gray. They are black and white, and it's a bad idea to try to like you know come up with some argument to get around the regs. Just follow the regs. That was a good synopsis of the questions. I think we're I think we're caught up. Nice. All right. Well, everybody, I want to thank you uh, again very much for the folks that have stuck around here for the, the last bit here. Uh, if you're watching this later on, on the web, um, appreciate you being here too and checking it out. Check out the handout down below. And just a quick reminder, next month we will be back with, I'm trying to get it to click, there it goes, with Roger Roger, cleared for what? Powered <laughs> operations. So that's going to be on April 20th, uh, 2023, 12 to 1. Drew, thanks for being here with us today and good good idea for a topic. I think people enjoyed thanks. it. Thanks yeah, for having me. Thanks. For, yeah, Dan. Thanks I feel like for I just help. took my check ride again, so I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> and it was only an hour and a half. Um, yeah. And then, of course, Dan, we appreciate you being here. And Stephen, mm -hmm. do you want to roll us out? Uh, I wish I had an instrument or music or something fun to play, but <laughs> or instead we'll just have to end the webinar. Anyway, yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for being here. We'll see you next thanks, time. Thanks, guys. Uh, <laughs>